Hello everyone, and I'm so glad to be back with you in this online contemporary worship experience. I'm Pastor Kennan, and I'm here with our incredible worship team, Amber and Eric, who just blessed our socks off with those songs, right? Uh, so good. I wanted to, before we get started, uh, invite you uh, to join us this coming uh, Sunday, uh, one week from today, uh, where we're going to be starting a new series called New Normal. And this is a really, really cool series. We're going to look at situations where we uh, have been oriented and then disoriented and then reoriented. Sound familiar? Nothing like a global pandemic to do something like that, like that right? But, uh, but we're going to talk about how that informs our mission and our vision right here at the church. But today we're going to wrap up our series called Your Kingdom Come. And I've been having a great time. We've been going through the Lord's Prayer now for two months, a line at a time. And this week, we're on the last line, deliver us from evil. Um, Amber's going to share uh, the, the Lord's Prayer with us right out of Matthew uh, chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as is as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Rescue us from the evil one. Deliver us from evil is another way that that is said. And so I want to get us kicked off with just a question here. Mm -hmm. What has your experience with evil looked like in your own life? What has your experience of evil look like in your own life? What comes to mind uh, when you think of this? Yeah, <clears throat> big one sticking out for me. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's looked like a lot of uh, really like my own personal choices, you mm -hmm. know? And then um, as those kind of, you know, the poorer ones, obviously. And, and then so once those start to snowball, um, evil can definitely rear its head in okay. a lot of different ways. Yeah. So that's for me. Thank you for that. Um, I think for me, I'm more in the past and not like now, but it would definitely be like self-doubt and like depression. Mm -hmm. Cause I think, I mean, to me that's evil, you know, like whether it's whatever it's brought on from, but yeah. battling like negativity Okay. is my, my personal evil. That's great. I appreciate you being so open and honest to share those things. We have a good friend uh, who attends the in-person experience on Sunday. Uh, his name is John Schatzel, and he has a testimony that he's going to share about his own experience with evil. Let's take a look. I'm John Schatzel, and I've been going to Broadmoor for 30 years, and this has been my church home for, uh, for that long. When I was 17 years old, I lost my sight. And I was a normal teenager, you know, uh, until this actually happened. I played football for, uh, for four years. You know, I was, you know, I knew that something was going on. I remember bringing my keys back to my mom and throwing them on the table and said, I couldn't, I can't do this anymore. I can't drive anymore because I'm not unsafe. I don't want to hurt anybody else. At first, I was tempted to go ahead and just um, just sit around and, and let the government give me a check, you know, and, and, and sit in a rocking chair and let let the world go by. I couldn't, can't read no more. You know, I couldn't do uh, play football no more. I couldn't do things that normal teenagers or normal kids would do. I was very angry with God. I was very angry because I said, why did you do this to me? Why not somebody else? Why somebody, not somebody else in my family? Why me? You know, I was very angry for, for so many years, for about five years, four or five years. You know, there's times where, you know, I just sit and say, okay, now what? But knowing that God is, has been with me is making it easier to, you know, to go ahead and, and go on with you know, what God wants me to do. When I was 20, I got married to my first wife, and for 18 years, there were some ups and some downs like everybody has. Well, one day she left, and it was really, really hard on me. Uh, and I, you know, tried very hard to keep the, the marriage going. 
but she left and I was bitter about it and I was you know I was tempted to do things that you know I don't, don't normally would do I wanted to do things that was things that she did to you know against me things that I know that I've you know God has delivered me from is being lonely and confusion on what I needed to do next um, I am very thankful for uh, the people at Broadmoor and especially our youth group that they came and pulled me in and loved me as I was, as I am, and helped me through the, my walk to get past the situation I was in, um, as well as you know, going into church and, and going through the singles class at Broadmoor, at Broadmoor also at the time. And through that singles class is where I met my lovely wife, Shannon. She has been my rock. She has been um, so much of my life. Uh, and being where I need to be right now, she has been, uh, you know, in, in times of uh, my struggle through my eyesight, uh, she has been there um, going ahead and um, lifting me up and being there for me when I'm at my, at my loneliest and my uh, uh, time of, uh, of, of need sometimes. The things that I go through knowing that I have Christian people in my life that, yes, I falter, I fall, but they're there as with Christ to pick me up and keep me going. I treasure these people from Broadmoor and, and who is in my life that keep me going. Blindness doesn't define who I am is Christ in me who shows that yes we are all crackpots we are all definitely a vessel who has things that God's not proud of but hopefully through those cracks that Christ is shown through those cracks that we know that people who see us know that Christ is in us very tall, but our spaceship will help us get us there. Wow, we are all crackpots. <laughs> I love that, and I really appreciate John for uh, being so vulnerable with us to share uh, his uh, own witness of deliverance uh, in his life. Um, you know, when, when we talk about being delivered from evil, it's a hard conversation to have because it's a conversation where we have to acknowledge that there is a spiritual war happening. Um, and spiritual warfare is difficult uh, conceptually, I think, uh, for us to uh, talk about because we process and handle that, I think, uh, different, uh, differently from one to another. And so, uh, so I'd say that kind of the first challenge that we have with this is that we sometimes don't understand spiritual warfare. Um, and so because of that, we don't pray and we don't read our Bible. Because I really believe that if we really understood deeply spiritual warfare, we would do both of those things daily. Uh, but we don't sometimes. And I, I'm going to just own my, even myself. You might say, a pastor doesn't read the Bible. Well, yeah, I mean, there are times when I don't. There are times when I go through seasons of my own mess and stuff in life. And so there are times where, you know, that can happen. And so I'm sure all of us can, can kind of accept the fact that, that, um, that that's not always the case and that's not what we do. But, but to have a conversation about spiritual warfare, we have to all kind of agree that right now we are in a battle against an enemy who is evil and who operates within a dominion that is also evil. It doesn't mean that God's not good. It doesn't mean that God's goodness is not greater than that. It just means that this dominion of evil exist. In fact, when we join the church, we actually say that one of our vows is to renounce that evil. And so, uh, but I think, you know, I think the other problem with evil is that we all look at it a little differently. Uh, I think for some people, uh, evil is the little horned guy, the red devil, right, with the tail and, and the pitchfork. 
And, uh, and so uh, I believe, though, that there is a real manifestation in the physical, psychological, and spiritual realities uh, that is not fully understood. And so, therefore, it is really hard sometimes to explain it. Would you agree? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that always amazes me is how much money Hollywood makes off of this very thing, right? Kind of exploiting uh, the fact that there is evil. Uh, and others do too, fortune tellers and other, other kinds of, of uh, for-profit uh, profiteering off of, off of this idea of spiritual warfare. I believe, though, that another accurate example of an enemy that is residing within a dominion of evil can take on these other really um, interesting uh, shapes. You know, it can be an opioid or, or an alcoholic beverage or, or a huge amount of debt in the dominion or in the realm of addiction. <laughs> you know, it can take on, you know, the form of, of pornographic downloads uh, in the realm of a black internet space, right? A black internet market that supports such a thing. Uh, a market of consumerism. Uh, a, a market of consumerism where there's predatory lending. A predatory lending would be the evil thing, right? In the middle of a dominion of, of, of uh, consumerism. And so this list, it can go on and on and on and on. But the truth is we face it, we operate and, and try to counter it you know, within our lives every single day. And I want you to think about that. And I want you to think about the, the enemies and the dominions of evil that you personally encounter and, 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 and in your own life and, and what those uh, look like for you. For example, in my own life, I'm able to witness that um, in a dominion of faithlessness and unbelief, I shared John's struggle and that I was angry at God for a long time. I was angry at God. And so I, I struggled to the point that I, uh, I turned my back on the church at one point in my life uh, for over a decade uh, because uh, I, blamed, I blamed God and I blamed religion instead of a few harmful people in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a set of circumstances. And so that caused me to be angry with God for a long, long time until I started coming to a Methodist church that was a church plant and I started hearing about God's grace and kind of a different view of God. Uh, and that, would, that helped me, different ideology about God and who God is and what God is responsible for and what God does and doesn't do. But the point is, these enemies and these dominions of evil, they disorient us and they confuse us. Right, And so uh, they confuse us about the reality of spiritual warfare. And therefore, they're given victories over Jesus and over the church triumphant, which Jesus created, because we simply do not understand it well. And trust me, if the enemies of darkness, if the enemies that operate in the dominion of evil can keep us from reading the word of God and praying, then they have done what they have set out to do. They, they've, they've caused us not to stand firm in our faith. They've caused us to, to question God and, and God's capabilities. And, and, uh, and they've caused us to kind of think that we know better than God does sometimes. And so I want you to be warned that, that the physical, psychological, and spiritual realms are fully integrated in this thing that we, we call life, and we are vulnerable to spiritual attack. Now, even Jesus was exposed to this reality. If you'll remember from early in the Gospels in Jesus' ministry, the first thing that happens after he's baptized is he is led into the desert and tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. That's the very first experience that the Bible describes of Jesus' ministry right after his baptism. It kicks it off, kicks off his kind of uh, story of ministry through the, through the area of Galilee. And so, uh, you know, uh, he was not, uh, you know, he wasn't impervious to this idea of a dominion of evil that operates. 
In fact, it, it, you know, he was praying and fasting the whole time in this experience because he was countering such a strong enemy who was promising the world and all of its riches and promising him all of these things and twisting scripture and all of that. But Jesus knew the word. Jesus knew that uh, a strong prayer life was important. And so he was able to stand firm in all of that. But it wasn't just Jesus either. His followers also experienced this. In fact, it was Peter, the apostle Peter, who described an enemy who is lying in wait to devour. And I think that's really interesting. You know, when I went to Kenya, I was able to go to the Masai Mara, which is a beautiful natural wildlife reserve and it had all the beautiful animals that Africa uh, has to offer. But I kept seeing these carcasses, these skeletons all over and they all looked alike. And I was kind of like, what is that animal? Whatever it is, it must not be very smart because <laughs> it is dead all over the place. And they're like, those are the wildebeest. And so these wildebeest, they would get picked off because the, the, and they, they go in a big herd. And so the enemy lies in wait and just picks them off and devours them one by one. And that's kind of how this works, right? That's kind of what the Apostle Peter was describing. And then there was the Apostle Paul who wrote about, uh, he spoke of a war against rulers and authorities and cosmic powers of this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And I couldn't help when I was reading uh, uh, his words about this, of remembering a, a discussion that I had on a mission trip recently to Chicago with our youth. And uh, a lady who had lived through the civil rights movement had uh, re retold a story uh, that, that she had of, of having her children crawl across the floor so that their silhouettes didn't appear in the windows because the civil rights movement gave cover to police officers who were gunning down and, and declaring an open season on black kids. Now, I'm not saying that all police officers are bad. To hear that would be to miss the point completely. But there is evil that operates, and sometimes it is injustice. The bottom line is their spiritual warfare, and sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes you can see it in our systems, uh, our systemic injustices. You can see it in addiction. You can see it in gangs. You can see it in sex trafficking and, and a whole bunch of other things. But there's other times where it's like what the Apostle Peter wrote about, where it's lying in wait and it's less obvious. It's in our relationships and, and it's in our glamorized gossip out in the church parking lot or, or, or in the hair salon, at the, at the community hair salon. You know, we have to understand, though, that this is not a new thing. It's not a 2021 thing. This is a thing that happened in Jesus' time as well. Take religion, which was kind of the thing I struggled with. Think about the religions that were at play when, when Jesus was walking the earth. On one end of the spectrum, we have, uh, you know, uh, the more, the, the, uh, uh, a lot of people today who believe that angels and demons are more like an ideological representation of good and evil, right? Uh, and so they hold that true evil is most apparent in, in how our world is developed, how our world is structured, and how our world functions. A lot of people hold that view. But in Jesus' times, they were just called the Sadducees. <laughs> Everything with them boiled down to sociology and how the world worked and how it functioned. On the other end of that spectrum were the radicals, right? These were the people who equated everything to spiritual warfare. These are the people where, you know, evil permeated all of life and everything was corrupt and, and all of that. And I, when I think about this kind of evil, I think today about our brothers and sisters from Westboro who show up at veterans' funerals and create havoc in the midst of people and families trying to mourn the loss of their loved ones. I think of the guy who stands on the soapbox with his bullhorn yelling, repent, because the end of the world is near, or else you're going to face these hellish repercussions in a lake of fire. In Jesus' time, these were the Essenes. <laughs> these, were the, these were the group uh, who everything to them boiled down to what was going to happen to you if you ignored the good news of, of the gospel. And then somewhere in the middle of all of that, we have a group that oppresses humanity with this kind of 
uh, deuteronomistic theology of, of you do good, you get good, you do bad, you get bad. It's kind of this ancient version of, of um, a prosperity gospel, if you will. So if you were blind like John back in Jesus' day, the Pharisees would have held, well, you were a sinner. You did something bad in your life. Well, you heard John. You heard his experience and his struggle with all of this. He didn't do anything wrong. He was a high school kid playing football, and he lost his sight. It wasn't because he was a bad person. It was because life happened. <laughs> And an unfortunate thing happened to him. And it's easy to blame that stuff on God. It really is. I'm glad that John came around to a different understanding after battling with spiritual warfare. To the Pharisees, if you put $10,000 in the offering plate, you are an outstanding citizen. As long as you obeyed the 613 laws to the T <laughs> and you never messed up on any of them, you know, just obey these 613 laws and God will bless you and keep you from all your enemies, right? So you earned your, your place. You earned, you know, you earned it. You, you gave a big offering in front of everybody so that you looked good. It was about appearances. And, and Jesus took issue with every single one of these religions. Every single one of them, he challenged them for not understanding spiritual warfare any better than they actually did. And believe me, I still think Jesus is challenging us today. I really do. In addition to our continued lack of understanding of spiritual warfare, that leaves us paralyzed to the point that we stop praying and reading our Bible, then there are those times when we pray for the kingdom of come, but then we don't live it out. <laughs> we pray for God's kingdom to come, but then we don't live it out. And you were talking a, a little bit about that in your testimony, Eric, of how you know, you're, <laughs> you're making choices and you're doing these things. And, and so you know, it's not because you want to be a bad guy. You're just not making the right choices, you know? We all do it. We all do that. So that's why it is important that we open up our Bibles. Jesus knew this scripture. He knew how to counter evil because he knew the word of God. And that's why we should focus on the Lord's Prayer for two months, one line at a time. That's the value of coming together and doing that as a church. This prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, it is a contextual prayer. Let me show you. Eric, um, would you share with us a passage out of uh, James? And it's uh, going to be in chapter 1, verse 13. What does the Word of God say about this idea of temptation and spiritual warfare? <clears throat> no one, when tempted, should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself tempts no one. You know, that's a beautiful word, but it's a word some of us might be really surprised to hear because we think that God does tempt us, right? But that's not it. We're not guaranteed that we're not going to be tempted in our lives, but it isn't God doing the tempting. It's God walking with us through that temptation. As Christ followers, we're supposedly to be aware and self-aware enough of our own shortcomings that when we pray that, uh, you know, not to be tempted, but then we turn around and expose ourselves to temptation, we're making ourselves really vulnerable in that. And so you're talking about some of those choices. That's, what, that's what's happening. We're praying your kingdom come, lead us not into temptation, but then we're putting ourselves in the very thing that we're praying we don't want to happen. So either God's lying or we are. And I'm going to take and put my money on who I think actually is. If you pray for God to deliver you from drama in your life, but then you go 10 shades of crazy at a party <laughs> on Saturday night, leaving a bunch of relationship carnage in your wake, then you've kind of lied before God. You didn't want the kingdom of God to come. You wanted the exact opposite of that more. Likewise, 
And these are hard truths, you guys. Likewise, if you pray for God to deliver you from gossip, but then you talk about someone instead of to them, you didn't want the kingdom of God to come. In fact, you wanted the exact opposite, more. God's kingdom come, it's a contextual prayer. It's a prayer for right now, right here. Deliver us from evil, that's also a contextual prayer. If you're bragging about how great you keep God, God's commandments and then bagging on other people for how poorly they do, that is not the kingdom of God, friends. If you're putting yourself or others into trials in life, that is not the kingdom of God. If you or people and your family or friends are being invited into a journey into temptation, that is not the kingdom of God. See, this prayer, it, pray, it, it, it plays itself out contextually, which is why Jesus taught it to his followers. Jesus taught his followers that if we don't understand spiritual warfare, we don't understand prayer. He said, don't get into the weeds like the Sadducees and the Essenes and the Pharisees did. He said, recognize the reality of spiritual warfare and keep your eyes on me. Read that word. Read God's word. He said for God's kingdom to come, we must pray it in and live it in, right? And he said social justice and extremism and fundamentalism, they are not anything more than idols that we sometimes worship. He said, your true power must be in your partnership with God to advance the kingdom of God, which is held up by the cross of Christ. That's what Jesus said. The prayer to God of your kingdom come begins with our enjoying of God's presence and our adoration of the one who experienced the ultimate pain and paid the ultimate price for our sin. The prayer to God for your kingdom to come continues not based on our own merit or our own strength or our ability to obey 613 laws, but in doing good and in loving God and in loving others in response to God's great love in our own situations, in our lives. Stop worrying about everybody else and what they did or did not do. That will more effectively manifest the kingdom of God if you worry about you and what you do or don't do. Remember, God's daily bread, it's, it's, it's more than just a loving parent meeting your practical needs. It is a connection between you and your loving parent through the reading of God's word and the prayers that you pray. Know that the importance of your relationship in this life is hinging on your ability to confess your own shortcomings. You will not stand before God on the day of judgment and account for other people. You're only going to be accounting for yourself. And forgive today to the extent that you want to be forgiven on that day. And recognize spiritual warfare so that you understand what you have been taught by Jesus to actually pray. Only then can, can we all live and pray in the victory of God. <laughs> and we can do that. Only then can we live with transparency and accountability to one another. We've been so vulnerable in these testimonies during this series and things that you've offered here in our discussions. And now you can counter your enemies and their dominion with generosity and humility and the ultimate victory that you might meet someone where they are and help them take some steps towards Jesus Christ. That's your mission. That's our mission together. Every time someone gives their life to Christ, 
the kingdom comes and we all win. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.